Unique people leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my special guests and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. My guest is Vivian Stoner Stringer, the women's basketball coach at the University of Iowa. She is the winningest coach in Iowa's school history. Vivian is the only coach to lead the Hawkeyes to 10 consecutive 20 victory seasons, nine straight NCAA tournament berths, six Big Ten titles, and appearance in the NCAA Final Four. Vivian became the first woman coach in history to guide two schools to the NCAA Women's Final Four, Pennsylvania Cheney State University women in 1982, and 11 years later, the Iowa women's basketball team. She inspires her young players to high levels of performance, and they are devoted to her. She nurtures their dreams and serves as their surrogate parent. On the international scene, she has coached in several countries, from Mexico to China, Japan to Brazil, she led the U.S. to the bronze medal in the 1991 Pan American Games in Havana, Cuba. In January of 94, she succeeded in winning her 500th victory against Michigan on Iowa's home court. In honor of that win, the Women's Athletic Department created the C. Vivian Stringer Endowed Scholarship. It's Iowa's first ever endowed scholarship named for an active coach. Her awards fill pages and pages. She has been awarded honors by sports and coaching organizations and sports magazines. She was named three times as a National Coach of the Year, three times NCAA District 5 Coach of the Year, the Big Ten Conference Coaching Peers, chose her the Coach of the Year in 91 and 93. In addition to all these honors, the Women's Basketball Coaches Association named her the recipient of the prestigious Carol Ekman Award. Vivian is the mother of three children, David, Janine, and Justin. Welcome to One of a Kind, Vivian. I'm going to start your story at the very beginning in Edenborn, Pennsylvania, where you were born March 16th, 19, was it 48? Mm -hmm. Yes. 48. Tell me a little bit about your parents and their expectations for and of you. Um, I think as a child growing up, I felt very fortunate always because I had um, a loving mom and dad who uh, who had high expectations um, in the classroom and and believed that uh, we should be as good as we possibly could and, and and that is to to so to speak not sell ourselves short but to expect us expect the best of ourselves and not make excuses. Uh, I think that uh, they were parents that demonstrated um, by their own actions. Um, you know, you hear that motto or the theory, honest days work, uh, you know, for honest days pay. Uh, you know, my father uh, was a hardworking uh, person who, who uh, you know, spent at least eight hours a day in the coal mine. And that is, is considered the second most hazardous uh, working, um, uh, uh, working job that you can have other than the farming. And my mom, in raising six children, uh, I certainly have an appreciation for what it takes to be a, a good uh, mother and a, um, a housekeeper. Uh, but she also worked, you know, outside the home. And um, we didn't have a lot, but we, you know, we had rather modest means. But uh, there was a great deal of love. Mm -hmm. um, there was a great deal of family unity, uh, and we we strove always to. Uh, to realize our dreams, and, and that was that uh, we would have it a little easier than our, our parents. And when we would see, you know, when, when you look at your parents work and struggle as hard as I did, uh, and I know my brothers and sisters did, you know, with, with soot in, in his nose and when he coughs, he's coughing black um, uh, stuff out of his throat, you knew then that um, 
um, you know, they were making major sacrifices. And, and then on the weekends, my father was a jazz musician as well. Mm -hmm. I, he enjoyed that, um, uh, and yet it was very tiring. Um, early in, in, in his life, um, probably by the age of about 42, my father lost one of his legs. Um, and it wasn't to an accident. We're not sure. I think it was uh, more arter arteriosclerosis. Mm -hmm. um, within about three years, he lost the other leg. And, and I say that because uh, I, I know I heard the sounds of pain and suffering that he went through uh, every day. But I can tell you that he still went to the coal mine. See, he still worked. You know, he got the prosthesis, prosthesis on mm -hmm. and um, a car that uh, had hand controls. Uh, and so when you talk about, uh, yeah, what it means to work, do I think that what I'm doing is so great or that I'm working hard? Uh, no. Uh, do I understand that you don't make excuses? Uh, yeah. D does, you know, do all of my sisters and brothers understand that? Very much so. Uh, and I, I, like I said, I, I thought that by example, uh, they were the most loving parents that, that gave a great deal of security uh, to their children and inspired us to do the best. You must have gotten your determination from him. Yeah. From your mother probably too. Yeah. Raising six children. Did you have a fantasy when you were a little girl of what you were going to do or be when you grew up? Um, I wanted to be on television. I think um, I used to, it, it was strange because I've, I've told this story many times. I would watch um, the likes of Wilma Rudolph uh, across mm -hmm. the finish line, I thought, oh, you know, I'll be a track star. And um, I had I had a couple of things, and I, I wanted to be a track star, and then I wanted to um, uh, be a judge, uh, and then I thought that I could be president of the United States, and I really did think those things. Um, and I, I guess that was because um, I really didn't think that that I was at all limited uh, by the fact one that I was a female, or two that I lived in Edenborn, which was rather remote compared to the rest of the world. Uh, or that I was a black uh, mm -hmm. female. Uh, none of that occurred to me. It, it, it occurred to me that I should just work hard to be a good student um, and to have good intentions and good feelings and people would know. But I, I think that with one of the things that I learned, uh, and I try to convey that with my athletes today, is that um, you know it's not enough to talk about things. You have to be willing to pay the price. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, and such. And, and I and I give you the example. Uh, you know, of, of wanting to be a track star. Because, see, all I saw was lights flickering and people screaming and cheering, and this seemed to be great. Uh, but when I had an opportunity to, you know, go to the high school and see the kind of work that it did, that it was taking place, I thought, now I'm not going to run all this and do all that for that moment. So I, you know, I, I, I gave up that, that idea. And really, even as I thought about becoming a lawyer, uh, I had an opportunity to visit um, one of our judges' uh, chambers. Um, and, and like I said, I wanted to be a judge because I, I saw so many things in this world that I wanted to change, and, and it looked good. But I thought, oh, I'm not going to discipline myself. I'm not that interested that I want to read all of this. You know, it, that, that didn't occur to me. And then as I, I thought about the president, it, as I looked at that, I thought, you know, he has a heck of a, a responsibility and you have no life whatsoever mm -hmm. to yourself. And um, actually, I became a coach by um, not stumbling, but let's say like this, I, I never really dreamed of becoming a coach uh, because to me that seemed rather inactive and boring. Oh, boring, mm -hmm. yes. I'm sure you don't think that now. I know that. <laughs> at Slippery Rock, were you, I know you got a scholarship there. Right. Did you play sports at Slippery Rock? Were you I did. I, I got an academic scholarship mm -hmm. to uh, Slippery Rock University. And you have to understand that at the time, uh, females weren't afforded the opportunity to even get a scholarship you know, in, in athletics. We didn't have teams. Uh, you know, I didn't play on an organized team in high school. I, I played with the guys every Friday and Saturday that I had an opportunity to do that. And uh, I felt bad because they would put their uniforms on on Saturday and Sunday and everybody would be screaming. You didn't get to do it. And I didn't get a chance to do that. Um, so I had an opportunity to play at mm -hmm. Slippery Rock, but not uh, that I had a scholarship uh, to play basketball. How you went in your first job outside of college, you must have been about 23, was that Cheney State University, is um, right? Yeah, I, um, it was Cheney. Um, and again, that's interesting because I remember my um, student um, teacher, uh, supervisor, saying to me that I think you would be better suited at the collegiate level. Um, 
because you know, you know, and, and in this instance, the um, the supervisor had watched you work in elementary and junior high school and high schools, and he just thought that there's something about me. He said, "Well, you, you should be working with college people." For one, I, I really wanted to work with young people who had demonstrated that they really want to be there. You know, I had an opportunity to work um, in the high schools, and some young people that are in high schools are there because their parents have said they have to be in it. I, I really wanted to try to work with people that are, were somewhat motivated. And, um, you know, I decided to, to go into that. You really made a difference at Cheney State. You walked into the president's office, I read, and said <laughs> you had a dream, mm -hmm. and uh, you went to the NCAA. Yeah, well, you know, I was very fortunate because our president was a visionary, and uh, he was one of these people who um, gave a great deal of encouragement uh, t to me, and much like my, my father and my mo mother, who who always made me feel that I could do anything, I could be anything that I, that I wanted to be. You know, it was just a matter of choosing and making a decision and paying the price. Well, with, with Dr. Mm -hmm. Wade Wilson, um, I, I felt that he had ultimate confidence in me and would do everything that he possibly could. And I remember him once, once saying to him that I wanted to play, our team to play at the Los Angeles Coliseum in, in California, and mm -hmm. that one day we would play in Madison Square Garden. Well, these, these are big, real big ideas. Here and that um, that you know I wanted to take our team to the championship at some point, and he said, you know, I love the enthusiasm and the way in which you approach your work, and I just there's something about you that makes me believe, you know, in what you say. And he said, you know, we don't have a lot because Cheney was a um, you know a predominantly black institution that had um, what about two thousand students? Yeah, fifteen hundred to yeah. uh, fifteen hundred to two thousand students. We had a total budget of about two thousand dollars. You know, we didn't even have enough money for leather basketballs. Mm -hmm. And so th the teams that we competed against were Penn State and, and Rutgers University and the University of Maryland and Pittsburgh. I mean, it, and we were, and, and at that time, uh, the governing bodies of athletics allowed you to compete up, mm -hmm. but you couldn't compete down. And, and say Penn State with its 50,000 uh, students, body population could not compete, you know, uh, at the Division three level. But the reverse was true. In, in other words, they were saying, well, if you're foolish enough with 2,000 students and this little budget to think that you can compete at this high level, then fine, go ahead and do it. Uh, but we not only did that, um, but uh, we did extremely well, obviously. And um, there, was, there was more. To me, um, it was a fulfillment because I've, I've never felt that coaching by itself was enough. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot more. What, I know you've been asked this many times, but there are people who are new to Iowa City who watch this program. What went into your decision to come to Iowa? Um, to leave the East Coast and your family? Kind of? Yeah, yeah, well, well, two things. One, um, as much as I really did uh, love Cheney and felt a deep sense of commitment, uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, we were strained uh, in that, um, we could no longer see schools were beginning to join conferences and that became difficult for us to to play as we were uh, ninety percent of our games were away and then it was becoming increasingly more difficult to travel uh, across the country it, it cost a lot of money and the team was good enough to compete at that high level and you have to have money to to do that or we need to be in a, in a bigger a stronger conference and um, I had come to that realization and aside from that uh, some of the great players who would always want to come because of, of the tradition in that. Uh, we're then getting scholarships to go to, you know, a University of Maryland or whatever, and they could keep the Pell Grant, which is the monies that the government would have given them, and, and, and you know, put that in their pocket. And we were at a, at a major disadvantage. Um, Dr. Uh, Ann Griffith was my basketball coach at Slippery Rock, and she uh, got her um, PhD here from the University of Iowa. And she'd given me a call. And in fact, she was a good friend of my husband, and mine, and um, she made me feel that everything would be fine. I have tremendous respect for her. I can't tell you how much, and a lot of uh, trust. And she felt that you know I should at least listen uh, to the the interests of the University of Iowa. I had an opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Grant, who was a good friend of Dr. Griffith, and um, the first and most important. Um, thing with me is that I have to have a feeling, a good feeling about the person and the people. Uh, and so I always trusted Dr. Griffith and still do. 
and had a good feeling about Dr. Grant, who, um, you know, uh, gave me the feeling that, yes, we can build these things together, much like uh, the mm -hmm. president at, uh, at Cheney University. So it was really those two people personally. How, when you recruit Vivian, what do you tell a prospective player about your coaching style? Um, I like to be a, a teacher uh, up there. It's, it's nothing different than, than in the classroom. Uh, I'm not the coach that's going to be in your face and tell you what you better do. Uh, you're coming here because you want to. I want you to be able to think the game, to analyze. I want to be able to teach you how to be uh, a thinker and a teacher of the game yourself. Uh, but we have to have the same uh, level of desire for perfection. Uh, you know, because I want to give you everything that I possibly can, but in return I expect the best of you as a student, as a citizen, and as an athlete. And I've never settled for crumbs or anything less than the best. And those are the only people that I want to, to you know, have around me. I was just speaking in Los Angeles uh, last week, and I was saying to so many of the coaches there that many times if you come to our practice, the athletes will be talking. But it's constructive uh, conversations that's taking place because we think they, that we've taught them to understand the game well enough that they can make corrections to one another, mm -hmm. you know, and that's much more important than, you know, as they refer in the Bible of being a uh, fisher of men uh, versus being, so to speak, given the information and just receiving the fish, but teach that person how to be a fisher of knowledge, and that's what we're doing here. Do you have any rules, a rule or a rule that's inviolate, that's non-negotiable that your players know? Um, well, there are a lot of rules, but um, I don't. I don't know Nothing. that we could say. Um, you give people second chances. I always uh, examine the situation and talk to the person mm -hmm. individually, and I always give them a chance to uh, to explain their side of things. I I think that the one thing that I say to them that is a must, and that is, see, first of all, we don't measure our success by the games that are won. Uh, so much as, uh, as, as where we're, we've come from and where we're going. And I think that if you address the small things, um, you know, of, of the game, and, and when we measure a person, um, at least our basketball program is going to be measured in the total person, then when we say that we're 100% successful, then we are. Because I didn't say we won all the games, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, but we feel we're, we're successful in life. Uh, and that is that when mom and dad see their, their daughters leave uh, their home, they're going to have a, a product that they can be real proud of. A Is that what you want most for your players? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that she's able to take a place in life and that she considers her experience mm -hmm. in basketball to have treated her um, to, uh, and, and, and helped her prepare better for how she's going to deal with life. And, and when you can feel like that, you know, and it's, and it's, and it's so easy to transfer what happens um, on a basketball court to, to life. You, you go, you know, to, to get a job. You're well qualified. You should have gotten it. You could have, you would have, you should have, and yet you didn't. Do you give up or do you come back mm -hmm. and find another way to get it done? I read uh, an article about, read a lot of articles about you, but when you were introduced as the new coach in April of 1983, you told the reporters at the press conference, I just want to quote it, I've always been one to accept a challenge. I'm a Pisces and I dream, and I'm a person who wants to make my dreams a reality. Well, you certainly did. You had this group of women who had, what, won about seven games before you came, and mm -hmm. the first year you were here, you won about 17, I think. Mm -hmm. How, what did you do? What, what <laughs> did you do? Um, first of all, I think that the attitudes have to change, and you have to, winning is an attitude. It's a learned behavior, just as losing is. And uh, I thought that um, rather than talk about something that was rather foreign, and that is winning, that we took s the small aspects, little things that we could do much better, especially those things that required a great deal of, of work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's just your willingness. It's the attitude that you bring to it. And, and I think the things that we felt we could address very quickly was that of defense. That particular aspect of the game. Um, is a willingness more than, any, than anything else. You don't have to be the quickest and the fleetest and the sharpest of eyes and all that. Uh, and, and, and we made ourselves you know, believe in that. And we promised not to ever come up short. And so that's the one thing that we tell all of our athletes. They may have off days in practice and, and, and in games, but 
the one thing they have to always promise is that they will always give it their greatest effort. Mm -hmm. And um, we help them to believe. And once we started to, to win one game, you know, uh, even in our losing, I'll, I'll tell you what, my assistant, Angie, who is working with me now, um, we had beaten, I remember this game distinctly because we had beaten the University of Michigan and they had never, you know, uh, won before. And we were in the locker room and as the, you know, and I was talking to the team and they were really excited about the fact that they had won. Well, I was very upset about it because, see, I wasn't measuring the game in whether we won or lost, but I was taking it apart and looking at the, you know, the, the sum of its parts, mm -hmm. so to speak. And they hadn't learned that yet. They were just satisfied with winning. And so I said, and tomorrow we're going to have practice at 6 o'clock in the morning. To me, that's punishment because I don't want to practice early <laughs> in the morning. You don't want to. Well, uh, the team and Angie as, as my captain, you know, just jumped up and said, that's great. We'll be here whatever time you say, 5 o'clock, we're ready to go. And my assistant looked at me and she said, they just still don't know, you know. But I'll tell you what, to show you what happened, the transformation as we understood what we were trying to get to, at the end of the year, we had done well enough to have been invited to the national tournament. But again, because I don't believe that we should come in the back door or we should take crumbs, this to Iowa was big. I mean, you win seven games the year before, and all of a sudden you're invited to the national tournament. But it wasn't the NCAAs. It was the National Invitational Tournament, which is a fine tournament, but it's the second level mm -hmm. to the NCAAs. Well, they were excited. The paper had written about it and thought it was great. And so I said, no, Iowa will not go unless it can go you know, first class. And you would think that the players, especially those who were seniors who had never tasted this kind of thing, would be upset. And, and yet they, they you're took, right, How coach. did they take it? Fine. They said, you're right, coach. You know. And you were getting through to them. Yes. They were listening and yeah. hearing what you had to they say. They heard it, and they felt it, and they came to expect more of themselves. And I think that you have to believe and trust in people, and you have to give them, just like children. Mm -hmm. You know, if you show them that you expect more of them, you, they'll surprise you because they'll give you more. And that's the same thing that happened with this team. And you must be really pleased how academically, I mean, your team is really doing, you have a graduation rate of about 97%. That's, that's right. That's it's, congratulations. It's, thank you. It's outstanding. Yeah. We're working hard. I want to ask you, you, you have wear a lot of hats. Um, mm -hmm. You are a mother, you're a sister, uh, you're a daughter, you're, you have a very public job. You have kids who view you as kind of the surrogate mother, the role model, and you have mm -hmm. all these fans. How do you do it? How do you do so much? Um, with a lot of help. And I tell you what, when the help breaks down, you got problems. I, uh, for years, um, my biggest, I mean, the biggest reason for the success that I've had uh, and it's, it's not anything that's, that's not known, but no one could know more than my husband and I, and it, it was just him that was always there for me. And, uh, and we were there for each other, but, um, but because of the public uh, demands of my life, uh, he was always there, and people, many times people didn't know what, why things happened or how things happened. Uh, certainly the children, you know, knew. Uh, and, and with his passing, uh, I've been fortunate because I've had a very strong family. Um, you know, a mom who lives with me and, and my sisters uh, and their families who help a lot, you know, whether it's coordinating, um, you know, with the house and helping me with uh, the children. Um, and it's, it, believe me, it's, um, it's that. It's, it's having an excellent secretary. Mm -hmm. It's having an administration that's very understanding. Uh, and surprisingly enough, I think um, the fans, though they're individuals and they're a thousand, so to speak, in their different places. I think that that they have been um, pretty understanding and, 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 and supportive. At least I know that and I sense that, so it doesn't strain me as much as, as one might think. Uh, there are times when um, you wonder which way is up. I mean, you, you but don't you don't raise it. your voice, do you? No, you I, I don't like to. I don't That's do that. That's amazing. There, not, not many people, not, there aren't many parents running around <laughs> who've never raised their voice. That's, that's uh, quite a remarkable trait, I think, with all the demands on you. Well, in practice, um, I do sometimes, but I, it, I just know that I don't function well. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd, I'd rather talk to you. But that probably goes back to the first statement when I, I, I was saying that um, my stu teaching supervisor thought that, you know, you should be working with college students. I, I think that we're, if you treat them as adults, and, and I just believe that if you and I have come together for a common purpose, that if you're not doing something, 
something you just don't understand. Uh, you know, and I want to make sure that I've explained it better. Now, if we understand that you just don't intend to do, then we're not, we don't have any business working together. Uh, and so for the most part, we're just going to work hard. I'm going to give my, my athletes everything that I can. And I know that they're going to give me everything that they can. And when that's happening, you need to let them think and do what they do best and let me think and do what I do best. Tell, how do you recharge your batteries? How do you kind of get renewed? Um, well, for one, uh, I, I'm, I'm driven. There's something inside of me that keeps driving me um, to do my best. I, I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoy the challenge of, of, of basketball. Um, it's like a chess game every day. And it's not like a lot of jobs that um, you might think, yeah, you have to have a high level of energy and a lot of patience and, and all the other things that, that we understand about this. But on the other hand, it's never boring. Mm -hmm. You know, you're working with human beings and you're shaping their lives. You see, you can see immediate results right away. You see long-term results, you see immediate results um, right away. And that's not true with most other jobs. Um, and so I think that my nature, um, is, is just such that it, it fits in well with this. Um, I do need the break when, when the season's over. Um, I want more than anything to get away from, from basketball and the responsibilities and, and looking at the many hours of tapes. I think that the thing that drives me or, or makes me most uncomfortable uh, and, and, and it causes me reason to regret uh, the kind of work that I do uh, a lot is um, my children, mm -hmm. and and I think that as a, as a parent, you you want to always spend as much time as you can. Tell me about them. Uh, tell me, uh, there, you have two sons two and sons, a daughter. Two sons and a daughter. And um, you were pregnant with, you got pregnant your first year of teaching with your youngest, is yeah, that right? Yeah, Justin, and I didn't know that um, prior to coming here. Had I known, I don't think I would have come, to tell you the <laughs> truth. Oh, I'm glad you, I'm glad I, you didn't know. Well, I, I tell you what, I thought I was just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't figure it out because I had never, I, I had never gotten sick with any of uh, the other children, but I thought maybe I had eaten um, soda crackers or something. Mm -hmm. It just didn't seem right, and then I found out I was pregnant, and I thought, oh, I'm in for it now. But um, I, like all parents, I think, see those times when, when you go to sleep at night and you think, gee, I mean, it just seems like they were just barely walking, and now. They're talking and they're asking you to drive a car and mm -hmm. you know all those other things that make you sad but we understand that that's what growing up is all about and if you've done a decent you know job with your children then you're hoping that they can find their place in life and be happy because it's all we really want it doesn't matter so much what they do as long as they're able to you know be comfortable and be happy in life and uh, sure you'd like the best you want the best for them and you try to provide that um, but when you don't have an opportunity to spend all the moments that you'd like, it bothers you. And I think that all parents feel that, even those that are there all the time. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine that um, with the work that I have that requires your going, you know, for two and three days and sometimes weeks at a time, you know, it's, it's incredible what you come back to see. And so, I, so many times at night, and when I start to think about it, I try to go to sleep quickly because it pains me to think that this is happening and I've known about it. It's like with a lot of things in life people tell you, uh, you know, a simple thing, don't touch the stove because the stove is hot. And it's, you know, okay, so in life you learn not to do that. And so many times you've heard, well, you know, try to take advantage as much as you can with the people that you love and you care about to show them and spend that time that's there. And you know that, and yet, um, you know, you're doing something that you enjoy, you're doing something that you're successful with and something that you need to do, and it's difficult to try to balance that. And so you try to make adjustments as much as you can um, in, in life. But uh, I will just try to continue to, you know, enjoy them as much as I can. My daughter, Nina, is 14 months, I mean, uh, 14 years old, in fact, today. But at 14 months, she, she got meningitis, and so that left her handicapped, which uh, requires a great deal more help and a great deal more concern uh, with her. and. Um, it's, it's always, uh, you know, a situation where you feel needed and you need to, to do deal so. Deal with it. You yeah, you, you're going you're gonna to deal with it. I mean, you have to deal with life, and that's where it is. You, you're, you've had a remarkable, uh, you've had a remarkable life, and you're so young. <laughs> and um, I loved reading, and my last question is that you, you said you loved to dream. Mm -hmm. What dream are you dreaming now for yourself? 
Uh, I have a lot of things. I, I think um, on a professional side of things, I would like to. Uh, I would see. I would like to see things concluded uh, with a national championship, um, and and maybe I should say several. Um, I, I I feel real good. There's there's just an outstanding group of young women that are here um, that I feel totally committed to. One is young people who I think are going to make a, a tremendous impact in life uh, in this world on this world um, more than I could ever express. Uh, I'm totally committed, to, you know, to to seeing that through. Uh, with their degrees, they're going to make something of themselves. Mm -hmm. I think together they're great. You know, they they they're, they're great talent, and I'm hoping that we can. Uh, realize national championship. There's a lot of things I'd like to say because I think that all too often when you're not at the top you can't say some things but there's so many things that people need to know that I'll just wait until that time and I'll mm -hmm. say what I think about some things. Um, I would like to really if I could just be the best mom if, if my kids can love me and respect me as much as I um, did my mom and dad I think that I'll I would have done a great deal. You had wonderful I can be parents. They were, I mean, and I, they were, my father was and my Your mom still is. is. Still living. Um, yeah, and, and, and my sisters and brothers and I always talk about that because I think it's important for kids to feel secure mm -hmm. and good about themselves. And I don't know how. My mom was a strong uh, lady. She dealt with a lot of adversity, um, you know, with my father passing at a very young age. And, and you know, she still somehow was able to, to, to uh, to instill uh, that drive mm -hmm. in us, and, and we saw. So I, um, I think that when it's all said and done, beyond all the awards that you get, we have a, a point in life, and that is to try to just be the best people that we can and try to make a real positive impact on other people. And beyond that, everything else is just fleeting. It, it leads from one year to the next. The other is permanent, and that's what you should strive for. At least that's what I'll strive for. Thanks, Vivian. It's been a privilege. Thank you. My guest on One of a Kind has been Vivian Stringer, the University of Iowa women's basketball coach. Headlines from state, national, and local newspapers and periodicals say much about my guest, and I just want to quote a few of the headlines. Coach Stringer descended on college basketball like a quiet storm and burst forth with a flood of victories. Another one, her coaching is tops for Stringer, her families are everything. Stringer, like a parent to her team. Vivian Stringer, big dreams and the determination to make them come true. Stringer wants to win back games for women in sports. Stringer meets life's challenges head on. Vivian Stringer is coach of the year. But perhaps the best way to describe my guest is what the Women's Basketball Coaches Association's Carol Ekman Award stands for. Vivian won it in 1993. This award is pre presented to a coach who exemplifies integrity and character through sportsmanship, commitment to the student athlete, ethical behavior, courage, and determination. What more can one say? Vivian Stringer is one of a kind. Thank you.